Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 105, Creativity, D&D Role-Playing. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my imaginative and creative co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. Glad to hear that. How was your week? It's been going all right so far. First, uh, it's I'm now back in school after my spring break. Okay. Nothing too uh, strenuous, I hope? Not really, no. Okay, good. So this is another creativity podcast. We had done three of them already. This was supposed to have been done along with the other three to make it a complete set of four. Unfortunately, we had some series of unfortunate events that had delayed our D&D session for a little while there. And we didn't want to jump into this one until we have the next session with the new Dungeon Master. So... We had our session last weekend, we have some opinions about it, and uh, we can now talk about it in a slightly more informed manner, I guess. Before we do that, though, I would uh, invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get the video versions of the podcast if you look for insights into things. That gives you video versions of all of our shows. Or you can get just the audio versions of the podcast listed as Insights Into Things. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. Uh, We would also invite folks to give us your feedback. Tell us how we're doing. Give us some suggestions for show topics. We're always looking for suggestions. Last week's show was actually a uh, a viewer-submitted suggestion. You can email your comments in to comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We are at insights into things on Instagram, or you can get us on our website where all those links are available at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready to get started? Yes, we are. All right, here we go. So what is role-playing? Let's have you tell us what is role-playing and what is D&D. So role-playing is the is the acting out is the acting out of the part of a particular person or character. You can compare it to acting out a story in a school play or a musical theater. D&D is the name of the game, well, D&D stands for a game that's called Dungeons and Dragons. What makes this game different from other games is that the core of D&D is storytelling. It is a fantasy-based role-playing game. One person, known as the Dungeon Master, is the one who creates the story and that the other players role-play to. Now, there are a number of different types of... Uh, role-playing games out there. D&D is probably the most famous. Uh, it's also the one that's probably the oldest. It was developed in the 1970s. It's been, all, been around a long time. Hmm. I, will, I will slightly disagree with the last sentence here. It's not the dungeon master that creates the story. It's the dungeon master and the players that create the story. Ah. So the dungeon master is more of a guide along that story. He's kind of the referee who who rules the makes the rulings based on the game mechanics. But ultimately it's the players who make the story, right? I mean, you're you're playing a role. And that role isn't a scripted role, it's a role that you play live 
on the fly as situations are thrown at you, right? Yep. So everyone makes that story. Now, granted, the Dungeon Master kind of puts together the encounters and stuff like that. Um, but that's really only part of the story. You yeah. Know, the real the real story, the real meat and potatoes of the story really is what the players do. Mm-hmm. And the Dungeon Master is just sort of there to kind of facilitate things. Yep. But aside from being fun, which I think it is, do you think d and fun? Yep. So aside from just being fun, there are actually benefits. And I was, when I looked over the show notes, I was actually kind of surprised that you, you found a website article with benefits for this. Mm-hmm. So I give you full props for the effort to, uh, to make this an informative podcast, not just a uh, entertaining podcast. Yeah, that's the thing. I really couldn't get too many benefits of D&D, but I was able to find some benefits of role-playing. And that works because it's, it's both, right? Yep. So the benefits that you found came from a website called PlaygroundResource.com. And you've got a few things in here about what benefits does role-playing offer teens? And we'll just sort of go back and forth and, and talk about these. So the first thing that they talk about is it sparks, uh, there are sparks of creativity and imagination. Role play triggers creativity and imagination. Role playing, as research studies suggest, develops a teen's capability to become resourceful. They get the chance to exercise their brains through imagination while they're still young. Now, you've been through... Uh, what, half a dozen uh, role-playing sessions now so far? Do you think it's helped you to spark your creativity and imagination? I mean, yeah. Um, the fact that we've done different stories has kind of want me to try and translate one of my stories into possibly a D&D session. Of course, creating a story as a dungeon master, you kind of have to um, technically be open to suggestions, and it's like a cre- a choose your own adventure kind yeah, of thing. Exactly. It helps to build social skills. Now in our group, our group is me, you, mommy, and Sam, your brother. So there's not a lot of socializing that goes on, but under normal circumstances, it builds social skills. So role play is an effective way to practice fundamental social skills. Teen intermingle teens intermingle with peers, bargain and work with each other. All these take place during role-playing activity. Social skills predict positive interpersonal ability and success in school. Teens with improved social skills show understanding and become good at creating meaningful relationships. Now, outside of our immediate play group, assuming we were playing with a larger group, because a lot of people are playing online now with, with people they've never even met, how do you think this type of interaction would help you to build your social skills i mean it would probably i'd probably learn how to talk to people a bit more and uh and how to interact with people a bit better um i kind of wish it would kind of help me learn how to start conversations because that's one social skill i am very bad at um, but once you get the conversation started, or at least on something that I can talk about, I can definitely have a good conversation with you. It's just starting the conversation is something I kind of have difficulty with, which is why now for D&D, whenever we do social encounters, I kind of want to be the first to start it. Well, that's good to know. So as the new, well, not new, but the next DM who's running things right now, I'll certainly keep that in mind. So the next thing is there are learning opportunities. The role play technique gives teens more opportunities for presenting them with a variety of different scenarios and situations which they may not otherwise be exposed to. They can explore true-to-life situations in a quote-unquote hands-on way, which is a great method for learning. Teens acquire experience and can try various approaches to fulfill their role in a supported environment. The participants can play a role they see from their own daily life or a role that is completely unknown to them. It's optimized learning in a fun way. So let me ask you, when you play, so you, you're on your second character now, you're fairly new to D&D. 
Do you play the characters like a unique character that you create it yourself? Or do you play it and inject it more with some of your personality and play it as if you were in that role yourself? Well, I do kind of try and make it a bit unique, and I kind of take this as an opportunity to not only work on my character creating, but also work on, but also kind of figure out how my characters would really interact. Um, my one character has a specific ba um, backstory that would kind of make her a bit more closed off, a little, um, but also, um, but also have certain connections with people. So I kind of have to think about, okay, so, uh, one of, um, one of the characters is close to her, so she kind of has to talk to her like they're old friends, while the other she doesn't know anything about, so she kind of has to pretend not to know him. Um, for personality-wise, um, like I said, I'm kind of trying new things. Like, I'm trying to start conversations more. I think that would be more of her character. Although that's probably, that's pretty much nothing how I am in real life. So, I'd say that she'd be decently social, but also kind of know when to keep to herself. Okay, so it's giving you that chance to sort of expand outside of your, your normal personality and kind of explore different aspects of things. Mm -hmm. Well, the next thing that they talk about is gaining independence. Role play helps teens gain independence, which has many added benefits to both the child and the parent. Pretend play helps teens make spur of the moment decisions without the guidance of parents, teachers, or elders. It is the first step towards becoming independent which will help them in many everyday situations in the present and future. How independent do you feel when we play? Uh, pretty independent. A lot of times when we do social um, interactions, especially when we have to decide and make decisions, um, I definitely feel pretty independent when um, I need to, like they said, like make quick and come up with quick decisions. The one um, scenario we went through was um, someone giving us riddles. Um, and although I technically wasn't able to answer any of them, because both Sam and Mommy were really quick to answer them, which was really kind of surprising, um, I still feel as though those kinds of scenarios, I feel a lot more independent, and I'm able to make my own decisions um, and answer them. Well, and to your credit, I did ask you the rest of the riddles later on that day and, or the next day, and you were able to get a good portion of those. So yep. I'm sure if you were given a couple of minutes more, you would have gotten the uh, original ones too. Mm -hmm. So the next thing they talk about is problem solving. Role play presents teens with assorted problems, both large and small, that need solutions and scenarios that require careful thought. They decide on the roles to assume – games to play, who is involved, rules to apply, materials needed, and how to prevail over negative situations if something turns out wrong or inappropriate. This is crucial in teen development and will help them for the rest of their lives. Have you had an opportunity to exercise any problem-solving skills in the D&D sessions you've had so far? Well, yeah. A lot of uh, different combat encounters I've tried to I've tried to kind of come up with different ways to solve it. Like, there was this one time in Sam's story where um, there was a fire, and I kind of mentioned this before, but I basically decided that, hey, since I can talk to animals, why don't I call up a pelican since we're over water so we can bring up some water and help spread out the fire? And it was kind of the same thing with the rest of us. We kind of had, it was kind of a new encounter, and we kind of had to figure out new and interesting ways on how to solve it. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. That's a good, uh, good example there. Mm -hmm. You can also learn to empathize through role-playing. Teens develop more of a sense of compassion and empathy once they take on different roles. For example, teen role-players who put themselves in the shoes of doctors, nurses, carpenters, mechanics, and various other professions will realize the value of those people's jobs. They will learn to appreciate and respect other people when they become grown-ups. And I think from a D&D &D perspective, 
putting yourself in the shoes of maybe an underprivileged individual, someone who may be getting bullied or some other similar situation like that. I mean, we're not really dealing with a lot of doctors and and lawyers and stuff in D&D, but the the types of roles, you know, you're going to encounter characters that are, for instance, unemployed. And you're going to see how that level of unemployment affects their everyday lives and how it makes their lives differently. Um, have you had a chance so far to really empathize, be put in the position to empathize with any of the characters or any of the adventurers that you've interacted with? Um, I think somewhat so far. We are kind of partly into your, um, your story, but we have met a couple characters that I kind of empathize for. Um, and well, so yeah, I definitely, and I definitely think that, um, moving forward with, um, the story and when we do get to meet more of the characters, I definitely think I'm going to learn to empathize with people who do go through those kinds of scenarios. Okay. The last thing they talk about here is it lets them explore different careers. Finally, role play is a fun developmental activity that enables teens to explore different career options. They experience what it's like to perform certain tasks of adults in a simulated and productive exercise. Once these teens grow older, they can more easily decide on what will interest or give them satisfaction. This kind of activity helps prepare them for college and future careers. So I don't think you're going to be a rogue or uh, a ranger uh, professionally anytime soon, but do you think that playing different roles here helps you to kind of explore different possibilities and, and maybe apply that to real life? Yeah, like there are, like I said, I like playing my one different character differently than how I would normally play. Um, and then I kind of have to figure out how they would react to certain scenarios and, um, what their, um, what consequences their, their actions or what result their actions have. So, yeah, I definitely think that, um, I will be, um, I am experiencing, once again, problem solving, but also how to handle things. Cool. Very cool. So you're getting more out of D&D than just the fun experience of D&D then? Yeah. Good. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about what some of your D&D experiences has been up until now. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. This week we're talking about our new creative endeavor, Dungeons and Dragons role playing. So we have some questions here, and I know all the answers to them, but I'm going to pretend that I don't just for the sake of interview purposes. <laughs> so the first question we have is what got you into playing Dungeons and Dragons? Well, my brother Sam had um, messaged you saying that. Um, he was, pl um, he, him and his friends were going to be planning on doing it, on having a D and D group. And he kind of wanted to use us somewhat as the guinea pigs for, um, it, because he, it was his first time being a dungeon master. So, um, basically, um, the first set, 
um, the first session, he kind of brought over, um, the story, um, and we were going to just play it out, um, and see, and once again, we were kind of just as guinea pigs for it. Okay. What was it like having Sam play the Dungeon Master? It was interesting. Um, so I don't really interact with Sam a lot, and having these D&D sessions was a time to kind of interact with him a bit more. Um, we definitely, um, I can definitely say it was, it was a really fun ex- time having him kind of tell the story because I had a lot, I, I loved storytelling and to kind of have that in common with him was kind of nice. Um, and I, and having him play the dungeon master, I really enjoyed his story. Um, and I really liked how you constantly tried to, um, move his expectations. You kept asking questions that he didn't necessarily have the answer for, and even mentioned it at some point. Yeah, the first couple of sessions were interesting for me because I haven't played D&D in probably 20 years myself. I used to play it a long time ago, but I've played other role-playing systems since then. But it's been probably a good three years, four years since I've done any kind of role playing. So it was, I was very rusty, uh, getting into it. And the last time that I played D and D, I didn't get to play it. I was the, at the time I was the game master. We were, we weren't running Dungeons and Dragons. We were running another system. Uh, so for me to have the opportunity to be a player was kind of a, I don't know, strange experience. So it took a little while for me to get comfortable with that. How are the first few sessions that we had with Sam? Do you have any recollection? Yeah, um, the first session we were kind of getting um, into what was going on. And it was confusing at first. Um, but once we kind of got the characters done, we actually had time for the story. Um, and Sam came up with a creative little town. Um, and the story of the t- and we kind of had a bit of a twist by the time with the town um and the session and the first few sessions we definitely had kind of a rocky start we weren't we didn't really have um actual figures we kind of just used your star wars figures from your one game um and eventually we did get our own figures um so so far um it was really just a lot of us trying to make the story and it really wasn't like the whole look of it because we didn't have a lot of supplies for it but i still found a lot of fun and um there were a lot of memorable there were some some memorable moments from the very first few sessions that i won't forget so what did the first few sessions consist of you talked about building a character did we spend a lot of time doing that Was there a lot of combat? Was there more dialogue, a lot of talking? Was there role-playing? Like, explain what some of the early sessions actually were. Well, um, the first part, after the character creation from the first session, um, we were basically thrown into combat, um, and we kind of had to fight off these monsters, and then the town town guards, the town guards, well, town rangers, who were the guards, had come up, saved us, and we were brought into the town, and by that point, we kind of got to the role-playing stage, where we either went to the bar, or, um, the tool, or the, uh, um, blacksmith, to, um, fix up our tools, or get stools, so, um, there was a bit of role playing there. Um, then during the next session, we ended up um, taking some of the rangers over to where basically the creatures lived, and we kind of realized, hey, the creatures probably don't shouldn't deserve this. So we kind of turned on the rangers, uh, killed them, and uh, there was the nature goddess who took them, and then we were kind of sent to this cave where. We had a very close battle with skeletons to get treasure from a 
um, temple cave thing. I don't really know what it was. Um, we got gold from it, and, um, then we, uh, um, then, uh, the next up, we ran into a centaur being captured by the same rangers, so we took them out, uh, got him, and we kind of learned about this dam that was protecting a town, but it caused a lot of the forest animals a lot of inconvenience, um, especially with the Murr people. So we kind of had to go recruiting for um, various different, for various different um, creatures. Uh, three specifically: the bird people, the centaurs, and the Murr folk. Um, and then once we recruited all of them, we basically went to battle and destroyed the dam. Okay. So that was our earlier sessions. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your character in this in this story. Tell us about the basics. You know what what race was the character? What class was it? Uh, what inspired it? How did you play the character? What were some of the motivations? You know, that sort of stuff. So my character was a. A tiefling. A tiefling. Um, and she was a ranger. Um, basically what inspired me to make her was I learned that the tieflings were kind of characters who weren't socially respected because they were kind of freaky. So I kind of thought, hey, that might actually be kind of cool. And for rangers, I kind of thought that being a nature folk with a bow would be kind of cool. So... And the fact that she was kind of this demon-looking thing would be kind of interesting. Um, and it was kind of lucky, the fact that um, the people were rangers, because I that kind of gave me an edge when we kind of had to trick them for certain things. Um, so that was kind of surprising. So, yeah. Um, so... Tell me how you like the the story. Did you enjoy the story that Sam made? Well, did you enjoy the story we all made, I guess I should ask. Uh, was it what you expected? Did it end the way that you thought it was going to end? And um, is it something that you want to continue to do? Um, It definitely seemed to start out... Um, It definitely started out... Um. It started out like, I guess, kind of a basic premise where three characters who don't know each other are left into a battle scenario. Uh, but then it started forming its own identity, and I really liked the part where we kind of had to get all of the um, different nature creatures to destroy the dam, and then we kind of... We technically ended on a cliffhanger, and I was kind of hoping, like, okay, what what's next? <laughs> so do you think... Uh, you think Sam did a very good job as the dungeon master, and do you think there are areas that he was better at than others? Um, yeah, I definitely think that maybe the role playing we could have added a bit more of that. He was definitely good on the combat. Um, and maybe other scenarios like the one fire scenario that he came up with would be nice. That's not like necessarily combat, but still kind of works the same way as combat. Okay. So I kind of like that. So are there any moments that you remember or that stick out that were entertaining or, you know, anything that was special? Tell us about, tell us about the one that sticks out the most in your mind. There's actually a lot that kind of stick out in my mind. Uh, the first being from the first session during the combat scenario. So... You were a dragonborn, and Mommy was uh, an elf wizard. Um, and there was one point, and she has the ability to have a fireball, uh, create a fireball. Um, and she had to roll a 20 sided die. And if most people, and if you don't know, when you roll a one, it's a critical fail. So you kind of. So, so you don't just she, miss, something bad happens. Yeah, so she she ended up rolling a one, and what happened was she was shooting at the bad guy that was right near you, and she ended up burning all, 
burning one of your burning your arm. Yeah. <laughs> got a little scourge. Fortunately, uh, fortunately for me, my character actually had resistance to fire. Yeah. So I didn't take as much damage as I normally would have. But still, you made a big deal out of it. <laughs> but yes, I learned to not stand anywhere near sh- where she'd be firing anymore after that. So what was your favorite part of role-playing in Sam's story? Um, I guess my favorite part... Hmm. Hmm. Can't breathe, can't breathe. <laughs> um, okay, so my favorite session was our last... My favorite would have to probably just be the entire last session. <laughs> he really upped the comedy on that one. We had a few funny scenarios before, but I definitely think that was the first time where we all kind of laughed. Yeah. Like, a ton. Like, I'm pretty sure you had trouble breathing afterwards because you were laughing so hard. So tell us what happened with your pelican that was so funny. <laughs> okay, so to... Um, have my spell work, I would have to touch the animal. So, since it was high up in the sky... Because we're flying on airships at this point. Yeah, we're flying on airships. Um, I had to use rope from the ship, and I lassoed its neck. And by the time I pulled it in and touched it, I have the ability to hear what it's thinking. (laughs) And Sam said all it was thinking was, can't breathe, can't breathe, can't breathe, can't breathe, because... The rope was still around his neck, and I'm like, okay, got to get that off. So that was Sam's hint to take the rope off the animal's neck. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty funny. We had a lot of fun. Um, Sam was gave us some really great scenarios that, that, you know, I still look back and laugh at now. So he did a very good job with with telling the story, certainly, uh, and with setting us up with some really good, uh, good situations. So let's take our second break, and we will come back and talk about what the future of D&D will bring. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We are talking D&D role playing. So what does the future of D&D hold for us as a gaming group, which is our question now? So um, first question we have is, did Sam's story inspire any of us to make our own stories? Well, yes. I already mentioned how he inspired me to create one of my stories into D&D, but he also inspired you to make your own story. So what stories are currently in the works? Well, I'm not entirely sure if your story is still in the works, but we are playing it now. So, your story um, about the tournament um, is we're now playing. Um, And my story is kind of a prequel to the actual movies I'm making now. So, um, hopefully those are... So... Yeah, that's, I don't know what to say. So, well, that's, that's enough. That's sufficient. <clears throat> so we, we did start playing, uh, my, in, my story last week. Uh, we had kind of an intro session and kind of mixed it up a little bit with, uh, some role playing, some riddles, some conversations, a little bit of combat, which you guys panicked right off the bat with the combat. 
I mean, I was the one who probably panicked the most since I was close to dying. Well, you you were very close to dying, yes. But you landed the, the most blows, I think, of, of everybody. Uh, tell us a little bit about what our current story entails. So, basically, um, all of... Basically, your story is about this tournament held by a mayor of a decently small town that's been underfunded. Um, and it is including four different types of, um, uh, challenges. Challenges. And you have, and you get a bunch of gold and your choice of a prize, um, for the top three champions. Well, the top three winners. Right. So you guys have started the story already. We The first part was making your way to this fictional town in a fictional world that, that we created. Uh, you had an encounter with uh, a traveling salesman. And then after that, fortunately, he didn't try to sell you anything. After that, you had an encounter with a leprechaun. Tell us about the leprechaun encounter. So the leprechaun um, was an encounter that was quite interesting. Um, basically, there was this one passage that I ended up drawing a picture for um, that was through this giant, uh, what would you call it, mountain, mountain canyon? Path. Mountain path. Um and either we could have gone through the dark, mysterious woods that you mentioned multiple times, or we could climb over, costing multiple days, or we could, or we could play his game, or we could pay a hundred. I don't know how much gold. A thousand. A thousand gold. Yeah, I made sure it was enough that you guys couldn't afford it. A thousand gold to him to pass, or we had to, pl or we would play his game. Um, if we got. We had to try answering five riddles. If we answered three of them, we could um, pass. If we answered all five, we could get a gift. Right. Now, I will tell you, you know, post-session now, that had the encounter with the traveling salesman gone differently, you could have wound up with enough funds to pay him to get through the pass. Seriously? Seriously. But you guys were very tame. You weren't the prototypical murder hobos that I expected you to be. You didn't oh. attack anybody. Oh, that's what that. So, so if we did that. So we, had you done that and searched a little bit in the camp there, you would have come out with quite a bit of, of cash that you could have paid the leprechaun with. I'm guessing you would have expected Sam's character to be like that. Uh, yeah, I actually kind of was. Yeah. So I was, I was. Pleasantly surprised that nobody got killed in that encounter, in that conversation. <laughs> um, so after that, so you solve the riddles, you get your prize. But what was your prize, by the way? The luck of the Irish. The luck of the Irish. Because you used an Irish. I just sort of made that up. <laughs> yeah, it was basically, you had a, what do you call it, cheat die? Cheat die, yeah. Which basically has no one, so no critical hits, and where the one would be, you got a 20. And basically what it was, was anytime you got a critical hit, you could exchange it to make it a 20, but you'd lose two hit points. Right. A crit if you got a critical miss, you could turn it into a critical natural 20, but you would take two damage from that. Mm -hmm. So you get through the passage... Uh, you go through the big mist in the middle of the passage, you come out of the passage, and what happens? You meet wolves. You meet them. So they came up, they shook your hands, and everybody was happy? <laughs> no, you see them. Right. And what happens? So we decide to fight them, um, and the two wolves come out. Uh, we end up attacking them, and then two larger wolves come out. We kill the two smaller wolves. The two larger wolves come out. And then even larger wolves with two heads come out. Yeah. And I had four more lined up that were larger <laughs> than those, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you eventually, your party gets help from a mysterious stranger who arrives uh, and her metallic little bird who pecks the eyes out of the wolves. Yep. And you survive. The guard escorts you to town. And that's sort of where we left off there with a little bit of role-playing there. So that's where we'll pick it up on the next session. 
So what I introduced at that point was a little combat, a little role playing, a little non mechanical role playing. So so role playing itself is, you know, rolling for wisdom and charisma and all that stuff. The non mechanical stuff was the actual um riddles that we did. Mm. So what do you like of of those things that I exposed you to, what did you like the most? Did you like the combat? Did you like the mechanical role playing? Did you like the riddles? What what sort of caught your interest? Um, I liked everything besides the combat because okay. I was nearly dead at that point. <laughs> so, I mean, I liked how you toned down how you didn't really put the combat too heavily. Although, you know, the combat that did arise, I nearly died. So, I liked the more role-playing aspect of it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, tell us about the new characters. So, everyone made new characters for this session. We didn't carry them over from Sam's story. Tell us about your character here. What class is it? What race is it? Uh, is it based on anything in particular? What inspired it? So, my character is a high elf who is a rogue, and she has a pet, a familiar badger. Um, and a familiar is basically a character you can, uh, you can basically sense through your animal. Um, and we kind of came up with the story, and Mommy's character also has a familiar who is a cat dragon. Well, it's a cat with dragon wings, basically. Well, technically bat wings, I guess. So, um, we know each other. We're from the same village. We have kind of similar backgrounds. Um, and we're familiar with each other because of our pets. And we have no, we have no knowledge of Sam's character. Okay. Um, and basically we have this whole thing where there was like a meditation process, um, in Latin. <laughs> In Latin, right. The title was in Latin, so my character kind of has part, knows part Latin, so some of the words um are named Latin. So, basically, there was this meditation process where you would find your spirit animal, basically, and for my character, it was hunting because her family, her father taught her um how to hunt, and... She went on her first hunt for her meditation process. She met the badger, named him Sade, and after knowing she he was a, her spirit animal, she named him Sage after the um after the plant that grew around her cottage, and yeah. Okay, so do you you said you were, you were talking about um maybe doing your own D and D session? Tell us a little bit about the the background story on on where we might see that particular story go so basically my story for the movie takes place in the modern day but there was something that happened very very before um where they end up getting crystals where the crystals come from um and basically the D session is kind of going to be how did the crystals get into the cave that's kind of what the story's going to focus around. It's going to be in medieval times after um, the whole, after the crystals were created and there are going to be 12 characters who go, f and there's going to be 12 characters, six of them good, six, six of them evil, who try to find those crystals, realize the danger of their powers and hide them um, in caves on earth where magic is kind of, where the magic's kind of toned down. Um, so the so the D and D session that you're planning is kind of a prequel to the story in the movie that you're creating as well. Yes. So it'll kind of set all that stuff up. That's that's interesting. Now, is that a story that you plan on maybe being a dungeon master for and running it and letting us play through, or did you have different plans for that? I'm not entirely sure. I still kind of have to see how it goes. It would be kind of cool to try figuring out the mechanics, but with the way that you play as a player, I'm going to feel as though I have to expect the unexpected and kind of come up with answers on the fly if I need to. 
Yeah, I guess I'm kind of a pain in the neck when it comes to being a player for a DM. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to come up with so many scenarios, yet there's always another scenario you never come up with. So, all right, that kind of brings us to the next series of questions, and, and that is being a dungeon master. So, aside from pain in the neck players like me, what do you think is the hardest part of being a dungeon master? Um... I'd say probably having to kind of come up with the basis of the story because you have to come up with so many different endings and it's not as easy as you think. Like, you can definitely go simple, but you can also go extremely complex. And there's a lot of storytelling that goes into it and you have to kind of also appease to everyone. And, like, what their choices are, and you have to kind of figure out, okay, so those cho- choices lead to these choices, what do they choose then? And then they, and then it kind of branches out, and you're left with possibly a completely different story you didn't really expect to happen. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, I didn't actually write a linear story. I sort of developed a couple of scenarios And what I did was I created a whole bunch of NPCs to put in that world that you can interact with, and each of them has a piece of the puzzle. So instead of having one story that leads to the next, that leads to the next to get you where you are, the entire story is sitting there in that town. And it's a matter of knowing which stone to turn over in what order to get the pieces of the story to unlock different parts of the story. Because I knew I wasn't going to be able to write a story and then have the party stick to that story. So I just kind of have an overall idea of of where we're going with it. And then where we eventually go, it's up to you guys because there's a whole bunch of side stories to do too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a mission hub sort of thing. Yeah, and that's probably going to be a problem with my story because it has a specific beginning and a specific ending. And then there's going to be so many different choices that have to kind of connect with each other in some respects, and it's going to be pretty difficult to get to that one specific ending because there's going to be so many different options, and I'm pretty sure if I do do the story, you're going to try screwing it up. (laughs) I'll try and be good for your story, okay? Thanks. So um, that's kind of it for the questions that I had. Um, Do you recommend this game or role-playing in general to... To other people to, to give it a try? I mean, yeah. Um, I definitely have a lot of fun with this game, and I definitely think many other people will also have fun with this game. Even if you really don't want to create the story, you can definitely have fun as a player because th- you still have a part of the story, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be creative with it. You also de- you, got- you also get plenty of benefits from it that we mentioned before, so... I would definitely recommend it to anyone who's willing to play. So what do you think of the group that you're playing with? Obviously, you're playing with family here. And I think one of the most important things about a a good D&D session is having good players in your group. Do you think the players that you have in your group right now help to bring the most out of each other and to bring the most enjoyment out of the story? Do you feel we are weak in some areas, stronger in others? Do you enjoy the group that you're playing with? Yeah, definitely. Um, I already have good connections with you and Mommy, and I'm able to gain more connections with Sam. So I definitely say that we are a decent D&D group, um, and we all know how to be in our characters and not really let our own personal decisions go into, well, partly maybe personal decisions but also kind of sticking to our characters also even though you're sometimes um even though sometimes you kind of mess up the story it's more of an enjoyable experience when you do so i'm kind of hoping that kind of thing happens well thanks unfortunately as the dm i really don't have an opportunity to screw up the story (laughs) so i'm going to have to leave that up to you guys as my players to do that now Mm -hmm. you're going to have to make decisions and do things that challenge me and kind of 
sort of what I did with Sam to kind of pull a, as much out of uh, the DM as possible. Mm -hmm. So that was all we have. We'll be right back for your closing thoughts and shout outs. Go for your closing thoughts. Okay, I just wanted to say to everyone out there, if you are planning on trying to do some type of D&D &D role playing session, I would definitely say that get I definitely say that it has plenty ben plenty of benefits to offer, and even if you don't like the first time, there's always going to be something that you can change and tweak to hopefully make it the best experience you can. D&D is all about experimenting and also, gaining connections with people you normally wouldn't really connect with. So, I definitely say give it a try if you're willing, if you're willing to, and have fun, guys. Okay. Sage advice as always. Uh, before we go, uh, I would once again uh, suggest folks subscribe to the podcast. This way you'll get it first thing Monday morning at 8 when we go live. You can get video versions of our podcast if you search for Insights into Things. That's all of our shows. Audio versions of just this podcast are found under Insights into Teens. We're listed on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Castro, and any place you can get a podcast. Uh, we would also invite you to give us your feedback, some show suggestions. Tell us where we're going wrong, where we're going right. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get high res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Just a side note there. If you are an Amazon prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch prime monthly subscription. We would greatly appreciate it if you threw that our way. It helps us to keep all these lights and cameras and action going on this side here. You can get audio versions of our podcast at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can find links to all those things on our website and more at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't, forget to, uh, and don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights in the Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights in the Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Stumbled over that one pretty good. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.